last two classes, I spent uh, a class and a half on this. So I'll complete this via video, I think. Uh, I'll post that. So I'll not take up today's class and because it will be part of the. Uh, so this then should get you into uh, things we have not covered. Of course, I spent a good amount of time on the injection tool and I gave you. Uh, philosophy of various things there, a different type of tooling materials and things like that. Uh, last class we went a little bit more in depth on the uh, related uh, processing with those tools. I hadn't covered, but then this is what I will go into, with this extrusion tooling, where you pretty much have uh, you know, spider dies with uh, like if you had to make a pattern, a profile like that, the die would be of that shape and then you would do that. So it would be a very different philosophy for tooling with that uh, processes. Then um, also we have to then uh, talk about tooling for um, aerospace sort of uh, parts, right? And there you will use a lot of composite tools and um, the reason you use this is for Aerospace uh, uh, parts are very large, they're very uh, awkward shape, they're not necessarily uh, stamped in uh, half a second or 30 seconds per uh, part. It's unique parts, low volume but high degree of complexity. So the tooling costs in metal can be uh, prohibitively expensive. So in this particular case you have uh, carbon fiber uh, tools. And I think at some time I mentioned they, they usually are a tooling fabric used, which is a heavy toe fabric which is used to produce these complex tools. And that's what is normally what is goes into the autoclave, where the whole tool is wheeled in after the part is laid down, and then it's wheeled out, it is then dismantled or detached from the part. So you use a lot of release film and release uh, between the part and the tool. Otherwise, the tool will get permanently attached to the part, right? And we obviously don't want that to happen. So there will be uh, more on that side of things. Then there are other things like marine and large applications um, uh, <coughs> parts in terms of size. Uh, we'll talk through some of that in the video actually. And then at the end, I will go into a little bit of the AM and then the prototyping. Most of you are kind of familiar with this aspect of it, but. I thought it might be good to cover that, that as well. So by the end of this, uh, you will have a, hopefully a comprehensive view of uh, all the possibilities for tooling, from low cost to high cost, to production, to prototyping, to all that range that you have to cover, right? So that's the thing. So today, in the spirit of moving on, I will not dwell on this. So today's class, will mostly I will get back to CAD. And before I do that, I'll uh, uh, lay out the philosophy of what we are trying to do here. So, so far you all have uh, done by way of the homework, I think, the motor blower assembly, the uh, bicycle with the uh, test and so on. Uh, you have done mostly things like parts and you have done things like assemblies, right? Um, I mean, most of you built a couple of parts, then you converted that into assembly, so you kind of worked in that space as such. I was hoping that we'd be far along from the 3DS side, but because of the software issues, we didn't make progress there. Nevertheless, uh, between Autodesk Inventor and that, you have a good exposure to that already. So what uh, I want to do today is extend this uh, discussion in a uh, couple of ways. So. Uh, this mostly when you do part design, you have to look at what is called as uh, interoperable, um, which means you want to be within the same environment without having to migrate all over the place from one software to the other. For one, it can get expensive in industry to do that if you have to have five, six different software and everything. Uh, so if the same environment works, and the company prefers that. Um, everything happened within that environment. So in that spirit, the uh, 3DS was an experience like that, right? You had all the, if you looked on the left side, all the modules were there, you pulled back and forth. So we'll get, still get to that, 
Uh, but in the same uh, environment, uh, the same philosophy works, whether you are in SOLIDWORKS or in Autodesk Inventor. So that is uh, very important. Uh, so the uh, goal of that is to minimize cost and basically have good compatibility back and forth, right? Mm -hmm. Between the models. So that is, uh, I spelled it wrong, but basically the, the whole thing works off of each other. So, obviously when you do parts and you do assemblies, you want to analyze them, right? You want to see how good they are and where the stress points are. So you need some outlet for uh, doing your finite element analysis or what is called as a structural FDA, right? Um, and that is typically uh, done in a number of ways. Uh, you have dedicated software to do FE. Of course, all of you know that you have uh, definitely uh, dedicated software like Ansys to do it or Abacus to do that. And uh, <clears throat> uh, there are a range of other software, Nastran, there's Patran, and uh, there is, of course, the uh, Extreme. Uh, there's MCQ and so on and so forth. So, I'd say there are at least 10, 15 uh, software like even Cosmos and uh, other dedicated software, Fluent and so on. Uh, all these are finite element packages, right? So, in the industry uh, looks at this. You have, of course, FastForm and uh, Deform. So some are very metals friendly, some are more uh, hybrid, some are more composites friendly, and so on. But all these are uh, industry recognized uh, software, right? Which uh, you, it doesn't matter which you use, you will end up uh, becoming good at one, but at least familiar with the others. The menus are very similar. At the end of the day, the principles remain the same. It's which buttons you press and which menus you pull up, how proficient you get at it. So that's why it's important to understand the basics before just learning the software for the sake of doing it, right? So all these things are capable of both uh, static and some are capable of uh, dynamic as well. And if you go to extreme dynamic analysis, then you have things like, of course, uh, <clears throat> there is the um, LSDyna, which does primarily uh, transient analysis for high uh, rate, short duration kind of activities like impact, for example, or blast and um, uh, certain uh, pulling or pushing. So things which happen at high scale, uh, high rates, but uh, for very short periods of time. So you have um, that kind of uh, uh, surface for that. And then you have, of course, along these lines, in this particular category, there's a lot of uh, custom um, uh, developed softwares by companies. So these are codes. The military has its own code. Like Epic is one that the army uses in this area. So you cannot uh, get access to this uh, as a general purpose user, but you have uh, a lot of uh, insight you can get uh, specifically for a problem that we, in this case the army has developed something. NASTAN was developed by NASA, of course, but NASA's mission is up to they're done with their. A base core mission, they will commercialize or they will make the software available to the public, basically, right? So in that sense, NASA, NASA became, uh, NASA's finite element analysis became very widely used across the board then. So this then became a version of NASA and became Patran, where Patran was primarily focused on the mesh generation, NASA was the solver, and that's how you uh, would uh, work in combination with these things. Then with these softwares, as you know, there's a lot of uh, meshing works that goes on. And uh, nowadays, most of the mesh generation is integrated within the software itself. But uh, when you do very detailed analysis, like let's say you're designing a car body, let's say you're designing an entire aircraft, then there are areas in that, like a bolt location or a hole or a, a detailed bearing, and areas which have high degree of uh, stress concentration, failure uh, possibilities, then you want to really zero in on that area and make it very fine. But then the computational time you, you take will be ridiculously high. So let's say there's a plate, a hole in a plate, 
So what you really want is around the hole you want the mesh to be very, very fine. But as you go away from the hole, you want the mesh to get more and more coarse because your pattern or your stress patterns are less affected away from the stress <coughs> concentration and more uh, generalized as you go uh, closer and closer to the extremities part here. So this way you kind of uh, optimize the mesh to uh, reduce your computation time, right? Uh, you don't want to uh, tie up the, because computational time is expensive, like if you're trying to run a model on the Titan gear or any of the high-end uh, mainframes, you have to pay by the hour or in fact by the minute period. So that way it's very important to minimize computational time in that particular case. So in this case, uh, there's a lot of effort that goes in mesh generation. And while the general purpose software do uh, basic mesh generation, uh, there are dedicated uh, tools like Hyper, Hyper Mesh is a good example. Where Hyper Mesh is uh, by Altair Engineering. Altair is a it's a worldwide company, of course, but they are headquartered in, in the Detroit or Michigan area. They are uh, spe specifically uh, they design the uh, uh, various tools in this side, like HyperMesh and OptiStruct is another tool that they have come up with. So these are uh, a specific software, like OptiStruct is for optimization of structures, structural optimization, that's why it's OptiStruct. HyperMesh is dedicated just for meshing. So there are people who make a living just in meshing a, a complex model. So they receive the CAD and they will uh, discretize that into very, very uh, fine meshes based on where it needs to be in areas away they would be less fine or more coarse. The shape of the mesh, whether it's a tetrahedron mesh or whether it means like a brick-like element, is it supposed to be a pentagonal, uh, two-dimensional, three-dimensional. So within the mesh uh, family, uh, based on what element is used for the analysis, your mesh would follow that uh, that uh, kind of uh, continuity, right? So it's very uh, it's a big art in doing this particular thing. So in terms of CAD, how CAD goes, your first skill set is concept on the sketch uh, that you do on the napkin. Then like I said, you kind of work into refine, then get it into CAD. And most of you have done this step. Then from CAD, you generally take it to your analysis tools. And as you become more proficient, you may choose any of these tools to further it. And then you further may want to get more complex by meshing it. So all this helps you define uh, critical things such as where are the key stress points, where are the key uh, strain points in the element, where are you getting maximum deflection, where is it most likely to get the high stress concentration factors in there. So these are all the type of information. You are worried about local and residual stresses, right? So all that information is what you are after in terms of part design. Because then that helps you decide where do you add material, where do you remove material, where there's a room for um, optimization and so on, right? So that is the thing. So in this business, there's something called uh, sensitivity analysis and there is something called uh, a convergence, right? So uh, obviously any uh, any uh, model that you develop in FEA has to convert for one. And then secondly, you have to see what is it most sensitive to. For example, if the whole in a plate analysis here, if I run this model and let's say I'm running this with, uh, I don't know, this might be a number of runs, this might be my mesh uh, size, for example, this might be my mesh shape, for example. So I could have my mesh parameters on the y-axis and run this once, twice, thrice, etc. So after a number of trials, what happens is there is a time when the so results will stabilize. For some time, the results are very sensitive to the uh, mesh uh, discretized uh, meshing. So if you change your mesh size, you may get different values of stress. That would not make sense because the model for a given load has to see a given stress. Right? So that business of converging to a point, this, where it becomes stable, is referred to as convergence, which means um, every modeler has to demonstrate that his or her model has actually converged to a, a stable solution. So uh, these are generally, when you do FEA, 
Uh, why would you do FEA? You do FEA because you generally don't have uh, closed form solutions, right? I mean, even if you had intensive math, you would come to a closed form solution, then you don't need FEA. But when the uh, model is complex enough, when there are too many things going on, you cannot reach a closed form solution. That's why you have to go with an approximate solution. And approximate is a very relative word, right? So that's where FEA helps you to get to a converging uh, solution, which is FEA based or finite element analysis based. So the whole reason for uh, discretizing a continuum, generally if you have a hole in a plate, you can just uh, uh, do a analysis without doing anything like that, right? But by meshing it, what you're doing, you are actually taking every discrete portion of that model and then breaking that whole continuum into a discrete, uh, uh, discrete medium. And by doing so, you're then accounting for all the local happenings within that model. So the purpose of meshing is to take a continuum and then be able to uh, discretize it to a, um, to a detailed local analysis, right? So that is uh, what a, every FEA model does. Whether it's an acoustical field or a fluid field, or if you're looking at uh, structural uh, the stresses within the model, the, um, the philosophy is the same. Like in the initial portion of this class, when I introduced the ways of analysis, in fluid analysis, it's very common to generate a, a what is called as an Eulerian mesh, right? So an Eulerian mesh is one that does not deform with the model. The mesh stays the same. So ideally, if you have a fluid coming in from here, the fluid keeps filling this mesh, right? So as the fluid fills the entire mesh at a certain portion, it's either a zero or a one, which means if it's zero, there is no fluid position there. If it's one, the fluid has fully filled that position. If it's something in between, it means it's a partial fill at that location. So here, when the mesh uh, does not deform, you are referring it to as uh, Eulerian mesh. So this is very common when you do things like fluid analysis, acoustical analysis, like that. But when you do things like this uh, uh, dynamic analysis, like crash, in the, uh, impact, crash, <coughs> blast, things like that, then what do you do? You Generally, your mesh actually deforms along with the event. In that case, that is referred to as a Lagrangian mesh. So a Lagrangian mesh is where the mesh is deforming along with the event. And of course, that's why the software like uh, LS Dyna particularly is more tuned to doing uh, this, this type of analysis. And then there is, of course, uh, sometimes they combine a Eulerian uh, and Lagrangian in the same <coughs> model, where some portions of the model are allowed to deform, some portions are not allowed to deform. So that is also done. When you have complex fluid interaction with the structure, uh, heat transfer field, you can do uh, combination models like that as well. So that is uh, going into the details of each of those software, of course, but then that may not be uh, the focus of this thing. So the reason I'm discussing all this today is that um, your CAD has to go through all those um, uh, choices. Uh, the end result is what you are after is generally the thing that I showed on the left side column or a thermal analysis would require how is heat flowing through the part, how quickly is the heat generated in the part. A fluid analysis would need to know is the fluid filled apart or you know, has it reached a certain location, that kind, that kind of thing. So FEA is that part of it. The other thing that you have to do in this is basically the process analysis, right? Uh, so the structural modeling and there is uh, process modeling as well. In process modeling, you are interested more in the uh, manufacturing simulation, right? Now, what do I mean by that? If you look at uh, uh, injection molding as an example, which is what we have talked about for some time. In injection molding, you want to know, for example, what? First of all, you want to know as the part Filled, right? Or what is the flow pattern in the part? Is the part is actually uh, feed polymer? Do you get the part? Of course, what is the effect of the gate location? Uh, where should you position the gate 
best position for the gate. So if you have a complex part, let's say something like that, you position the gate here, just one gate, and hope for the best and pray that it fills the whole thing. Or do you position a part gate here and a gate here and then allow the materials to flow from both sides, but then in that process would you end up getting a wear line there? So those decisions have to be made, and that's why you need some sort of a virtual guidance before you cut the tool. The minute you cut the tool, you're really uh, putting dollars to work and uh, management gets very nervous without um, any predictive analysis done to make sure it is going to work or not. The other factor is what is the effect of viscosity of the polymers you're using. Because if I have a certain fill pattern, will I get full uh, fill or will I get freeze off? The part, will the polymer freeze halfway through the fill simply because it's a competition between uh, filling and cooling, right? And flow and cool. So it will be, sometimes you may not get this part to fit, everything else will fit, but then that will cause a reject in the part, for example. Also, what is the effect of residual stresses in this part, right? You will get to see, uh, do I get any uh, things. In this also, I'm very interested in weld lines. Like, remember the cell phone example we talked about? You have a uh, lot of chances of getting weld lines in, in things like that. Uh, what is the pressures that I should apply? How much of uh, differential uh, thermal gradients do I have in the part? Because I may shoot the polymer at 400 degrees F for whatever, but if it has different wall thicknesses, it's going to have different cooling, right? If the part is thick at one location, and if the cross-section of the part is something like that, say, it's going to take longer for the part to fill through that thickness than it is to cool the thickness, right? And when there's differential cooling, you want to you'll see that the part will want to start warping in a certain direction, and all that is tied to the geometry. So in that case, uh, does it make sense to start filling this area and have this area fill last to give it more time to come to speed? So there's a lot of decision making that goes on, and that's where the manufacturing simulation will help you with all those sort of things. But here, the starting point again is CAD. Once you have a CAD model, generally the way the software is work is you migrate from CAD to the uh, mold flow uh, advisor in this case. is For Autodesk it's called mold flow advisor. Uh, for other software it's called other things, right? But mold flow advisor is generally for injection molding and uh, flow processes like that. Autodesk's um, uh, compression molding software is referred to as mold flow inside. And, um, and these are all branding tricks, but uh, essentially this is very geared to injection molding. This is very geared to compression molding. So they are process, uh, they, they're process defined software. So they will take you from CAD to the process. Then the FEA takes you from the CAD to the analysis. So under that you have all these tools. You can segue and see where is it you want to end up with this thing. So today's uh, state of art in manufacturing simulation, and I'm going to be a little bit uh, uh, brief here, but on the metal side, I think I showed you, uh, or I may have skipped, but uh, when you do sheet metal, uh, basically the uh, software, like most of the auto OEMs and the sheet manufacturers, like the ducting people and all of them use something called fast form. So fast form can take CAD and sheet metal, all of you know how to do a sheet metal CAD now. So they can take that sheet metal part into the manufacturing side. So in this particular case, what does the simulation have to give you? So if you have like uh, rolled steel like so, what it comes in uh, form, basically rolled steel, right? What is it you're interested in knowing? How can I cut my blanks on this in the most optimized way? How can I minimize the scrap between those? So how do I, if I have to cut an awkward shape, like say, uh, which has some shape like that. Now, does it make sense to lay the next one exactly like that? Maybe not. You can take this and lay it like that. So then it will nest properly, right? So the amount of scrap material to waste will be very much eliminated or minimized. So you want to maximize the uh, blank and you want to minimize the scrap. 
So these softwares do a couple of things. Uh, they will give you the manufacturing end of it, and also they will give you the optimization of the material end of it. On the manufacturing end, let's say you're trying to produce something which uh, looks like this. This is your part, say. That means your dies would have to be something like this. And this let's make it really interesting by so the die would have to be something like that. So this is the upper die, uh, the lower die, and this is the part itself, right? In this particular case, then, these dies are treated, and I've said this before, as non-deforming dies, which means in a CAD situation, you have to define this shape, you have to define this shape, you have to define your part as well, and then you have to define the mating surfaces, all this, the clamp down pressures of this, the closing speed of the uh, male coming at the cavity, and then the shape and size of your blank. All this is the input that goes into the model, right? And then for the material itself that is there, you have to provide its uh, nonlinear uh, uh, behavior, stress strain behavior, because assuming these are, if it's aluminum, you have to have this curve. If it's a nonlinear metal, you have to have this curve. If it's a brittle material, you have that curve. All that goes into the definition of the material inputs into that, and your, uh, like I said, the K value, the N value for strain hardening exponent, and all that within sheet metal. That goes in material input, and then that becomes the basis of understanding the formability of this particular uh, part, right? In this analysis, you're interested in does the part uh, form, the FLD for that, uh, what is this limiting strains, and that becomes your guideline to your customer that use this press of this capacity, this should be your blank size, this should be the shape of the blank, uh, this is what the operating factors are. So to the manufacturing floor, you should give that guidance, right? And for the nesting blank, the people who are cutting this uh, forms, you may have a second vendor from outside who's doing all your cutting work. You have to give them then the, what is called as a DXF files, uh, CAD files, 2D, with the actual patterns. Then they will take that and they will cut it to shape, so you, it comes to you in boxes, then you will feed it and produce your, your part. So the simulation on the sheet metal side is done very well by tools such as these. Now if you're doing cast metals, this is for sheet metals. If you're doing cast metals, of course casting is more of a flow process, right? So you have different software, like Procast is one of the industry's uh, uh, standard software there. Pro Procast is, uh, again, you require the viscosity of the liquid, the position of your runners, the uh, pattern of your tools, <coughs> And it will then predict, for example, are there any void formations, where is the part likely to exhibit um, high differential cooling and things like that. So that is the point of interest there. If you're doing uh, forgings and things like bulk formings, you have a software called <coughs> Data that does it. And if you're interested of any of these, all you have to do is look up in details of those. But Deform can do all the uh, bulk forming that we talked about, like forging, rolling, uh, drawing, extrusion, all of those are families of processes that this uh, does. And you'll be amazed how uh, similar the user interface is across all <coughs> so Once you know one software, the user interface is really very uh, translatable across the rest. You define your materials, you define your input data for that, all your uh, <coughs> viscosity and factors like that. In this case, define your tool factors, your contact conditions, the shape of your blank, the CAD of your part, and then you can a speed of closing, and then based on that, you can generate all the outputs. Of course, the outputs from this would be things like spring back, wrinkling, tearing, local stresses. Those would be of, of interest to you. So I'm not ignoring the metals world, but I'm just uh, giving you an idea of what the manufacturing simulation and on that I need to do, right? So, now of course, all these softwares are primarily uh, uh, meant for number of materials. Composites and plastics would be uh, also uh, used or capable in this software. Some are more very composite specific because of the anisotropy, lamination, layers, it's, it's very involved, so they would 
focus just on that aspect of it. So the uh, other uh, software we talk about on the plastic side, of course, is the, uh, like I said, in on the plastic side, you have more flow, which is uh, a common one. And this last class, I may have covered some of this. For extrusion, there's something called poly extrude, actually. Um, then there is the um, compression molding software, which is called as uh, Drew a blank here, basically, so that's why the star. Yeah, yeah, no, I know it. Care press. Should I remember? Care press, right? So those are some of the common ones. So this does injection molding, this does extrusion, uh, this does compression molding, and so on. So for each process, there is some uh, level of uh, uh, software that is backed by that. Some are more mature and some are less uh, mature, they are more industrially used. On the composite side, of course, there is uh, a host of software you would use on there for modeling. Uh, PAM uh, form, this is the ESI group in uh, France and of course in the Detroit. They do simulations of things like uh, uh, forming, like vacuum forming. So all your carpets and uh, interiors of vehicles, you know, all the complex uh, shaping is first simulated with this software. So you take a blank a sheet and you can draw the sheet into different forms. So with uh, drapeability, the wrinkling of the sheets, the draw of the sheets, all those are factors. Then the spam RTM which does uh, what? Like the name says resin transfer molding. Also there is a software from the Netherlands which is called Polyworks which is heavily used. And the University of Delaware has developed a software called LIMS for liquid molding simulation. So there is, uh, again, like I said, there's a lot of custom software in this business, but a lot of commercial one as well. So this does things like liquid molding simulations, resin transfer molding, vacuum infusion, things like that. This is, like I said, forming simulations here. And likewise, I can go on and on, but for each process, there is, uh, a certain simulation tool that is used. So you'll be very well served if you get confident with a CAD package, with a manufacturing simulation package, and uh, something that does an FEA package. Between this, it's almost a given that you're going to need this in any any sort of job that you end up doing. Either to communicate with people to do it, or to do it yourself, right? You're going to need that. Uh, all right, so let me restate that. You need to have CAD proficiency in anyone. You need to have something around the manufacturing simulation and then the FEA, which is structural analysis part of it. So all these actually work hand in hand. There's no, uh, oh, he's doing it, so I don't have to bother. Mentality will not work. Um, so any questions about this? Or, uh, Comments, I guess. Hearing none, we will move on. So I just demo a few things to you today. This will become the uh, the uh, basis for the part two of test two. If you see what I'm saying. So. Um, I'm just going to go over a few things here. One is, of course, uh, the tool itself. So, uh, if you have a part, uh, the basic idea is how do you uh, make a tool to do some prototyping? Like, that's your basic request or idea is, okay, I want to do some prototyping. One way is just to call the machine is wait for him to return your call, or the other way is to be active and develop the tool and say, this is what I want. So in this particular example I'm showing you this one very simplistic view uh, using the split option and there's one which is more involved if you will. Uh, this is based on mold design uh, as part of the inventor uh, family, right? That's, that's the thing. Uh, the other thing we'll do is uh, from part we will look at within the environment itself how to run the FEA. It's, uh, pretty straightforward to do 
at least within the environment, how to run, run the FP, right? And then the third thing we'll have to do is how to take the part and take it through like a mold flow uh, uh, simulation, right? That's, that's what it is. So if you loaded your uh, Autodesk license correctly in the first week or two, I believe you should have access to all of these. It shouldn't uh, have a problem. If it's asking, it's asked for a specific license for uh, mold flow advisor, uh, all I can say is good luck. Right? So, I, I hope it, uh, it should be the rest of the models. And then I'll point you to some videos to practice that may be helpful. So. Packages that you'd recommend for like composite design and composite laminate? Yeah, ANSYS does a very good job of composites. Of course, Abacus is very composite friendly as well. Uh, we in our lab prefer ANSYS for the most part, but again, remember this is just our preference. Every uh, university or company has their own uh, specific. Preferences, right? And that sometimes it is based on uh, what their customers are wanting them to use. Sometimes it is uh, somebody within the company has started that. At the university, is always the faculty is used to a certain something, and he or she carries that on. So it's, there is no set guideline, unfortunately. It's all over. The place. That's why I was hoping that 3D has gives you a very industry relevant view. But um, all the principles we are learning, of course, are common across across that. So I just want to make that clear. So if I'm in your way here. So. <coughs> and of course you guys are much better at this than me. So I'm just uh, going through this first example here. So what I'm just closing this out. I uh, just read something. So this is a uh, model, as you can see, right? It is. Uh, it has a certain shape. It has a V, and it has some kind of a uh, curvature here. It's a flat plane. So what I've done is, uh, uh, I don't know, you have to go home to get to the base view here. Um, so it's a basic profile that I've extruded to that shape right there. And I've added a work plane through the center of the part. So I can do that, right? If I go to work feature plane, I can uh, use any number of planes I can add to it. So if I say mid plane, between two planes, I can select the top surface, the back surface, and then it puts the plane through the model, that's that's what it has happened there. More or less. So then, uh, this uh, what the idea is. This is my part. I want to build a tool that makes that part correct. So I want a male and a female that, that makes makes that part. That's the idea. So what I can do then is I can say a sketch, and, uh, uh, and then I can write a sketch on that mid plane, right? So basically there. So I'm just going to sketch a, a box, if you will, which is uh, kind of going to be the boundaries of my mold as such. So you can, of course, measure it to any way you like and uh, do that, right? So then, so I've created that. Then I want to extrude that uh, solid. I want to do it both ways. So using the center plane extrudes both sides equally. I want to treat that as a solid. So that's what I'm so it treated. So now the part is buried, you know, inside that uh, that that cavity, basically. Um, then what I want to tell it, I want to tell it to combine, which is what I do here. I want to combine the base, which is that, with that, right, which is my model inside there, the tool body, right, and then. I would say okay. So now both of those things have been combined more or less. If I look at here, I would have now 
two solids, right? Solid and the second solid, which is which is that one. Uh, then now I'm going to say split that solid back here and split it uh, along that uh, work plane that I had generated there. I just want to. That's why I put it in the middle because I want it to be on on both sides, right? And then I say okay. So now you can see it has split that part across that feature there. Um, then, like I said, I have to select my solids, which is this solid and the second solid which I had, and. Uh, I have to convert those solids. I mean, I have basically after splitting, treat them as two separate uh, parts. That's what I'm trying to do here. So this step uh, brings it back to where you can't see anything really happening, but uh, you have to take my word for it, I guess. But um, now you see, if I color it, I know that this one part, that's my <coughs> second part. So if I look down at this right here, I can ground one side, which means it will move. The other side will stay grounded, for example, right? So now you see what it has actually done. It has taken my part, right? And it has split the part down the middle. It has created two cavities, a top and a bottom cavity. And then, so anything I mold between those becomes my, my part. So when you're doing something very simple, which doesn't have like, there's no male protrusion, female protrusion, I just took one part, half of the part will be created on the top side, half would be created on the bottom side. So the parting line in this case, like you call parting line, is the line that uh, uh, parts the two tools together. The parting line is right through the center of the part. I could have put the parting line on the top of the part by putting the work plane then, then the entire part would be produced on one side, and just the top side would just be a flap, just to cover or close it, right? So if you're doing simple models, you can do that as well. Everything can be produced on one half of the tool. The other half could just be a simple plate. If you want to reduce machining cost dramatically, that's one way uh, to go about it, is just to make it very, very simple. So this split kind of like this is more for like compression? Yeah, this is still, com I mean, basically I'm going back and forth. The injection molding tools will come to it in a bit. But this is like if you want something to create a basic geometry or a part, then this would be one of the very simplest ways of doing it. This is what I'm trying to show there, I guess. Uh, okay. So now I'm going to... Uh, Let's, let's see how I do this one. Let's start from scratch here. So I'm starting the part eight. Something basic, I'm just starting up here. So I said you guys have a lot more complex models to Basically you are closing on this and uh, let's say I extrude that. To whatever depth that's fine. So I just uh, started with something like that. So any geometry you have, you can first of course CAD it up. You can go to your simulation here. And if you do this, uh, it's going to take you to the... Well, my window is locked. Yeah, that's better. So, now it brought me to this uh, menu, right, which is my analysis or FEA menu. Now in this particular case, you'll notice that you can define your uh, material, first of what type of analysis you want. In this particular case, I'm doing a simulation, it 
design objective is a single point simulation. Um, I'm doing a static analysis. The software also has capability to do modal analysis. So if you're doing vibration response, you can uh, get the model to start exciting and uh, do the modal analysis as well. But static analysis is simply uh, the model is treated as static. So you're just applying loads and there's like no fatigue, vibration, etc. going on, right? So it's like the basic uh, approach here. So none of the parts here are separated, so it's treated as a bonded model, which means everything is connected, like welded would be a good example of bonded and so on. Uh, material, of course, you have um, a lot of choices to choose from. Like if you want to define your own material, it has a material library, a limited library in this case, because we have a limited license, right? But you'll have pretty much uh, three, four thousand material options that you can go with. So it's treating it, say, aluminum, I pick that, then it has its uh, well-defined yield strength and um, the characteristics of that material is already inbuilt into the software. If you are defining your own materials, then you have to input all the data as a custom material, actually. So that is... Uh, Can you show how you got to that window again from part? I don't have a stress analysis option. You should. There should be a simulation tab there. So I went to, uh, so let's go through this, Jared, and then come back to it because I'm worried I'm going to lose it. So maybe not, but I don't want to risk it. So this is the material. Then constraints. Now constraints means the model cannot be free floating, right? It has to be held somehow in place. So how is the model constrained? You have to say that. Is it. Uh, constrained at the uh, at a single point, is it constrained along a line or a base or whatever have you. And this part being thicker, I can constrain it, let's say, a location. I can give it a location, right? And then say, okay, I want this whole base to be constrained. And then I say apply and say, okay. So now it is, uh, I believe it is constrained that base. So then I can go to loads. So I have a number of ways this thing can load, right? And this is where you play around a little bit because you have pressure loads, you have point loads, you have uh, bearing loads if it's around the hole, for example, gravity load, right? You can apply moment as a load as well and so on. So I'm just going to apply a, a force here and I'm going to say let it be along this entire face is what, what I'm saying. And how much force I can I don't know, let's say 2,000 pounds or something. This, uh, and you have to be realistic in what you're giving it, right? So it's applied to force. You know that it has taken effect when you see this arrow. That means it has, it has uh, made uh, there. Now contacts I'm not using. These are generally used when you're doing bonded surfaces. Like if you have dissimilar materials like copper to bronze or something, then you have to define the contact surface as well. Um, like I said, the meshing in this is already inbuilt meshing, which is uh, part of it. If you use hypermesh, at this stage you take the CAD model, you mesh the part, and you import it into here. But we are not doing that here, obviously. So we are meshing the part, and the meshing, uh, it's, it's a small part, so meshing went pretty quick, right? These are uh, three-dimensional elements, so they have tetrahedron or, you know, uh, features like that, and so like, like brick elements is what the mesh is, right? Then you are solving, and sometimes uh, this is where you have to give you errors and so on, but uh, it's a simple enough model. So, uh, and then of course it gives you deformed state, undeformed state, and everything. Um, the real thing, if you are showing it to a customer or something, you can animate your results, for example to show how does the stress develop as a function of time, right? Uh, you can change the speed of the animation as well to show the critical points at which the stresses will take shape, for example. Uh, you can also do probing, like looking at point by point what the magnitude of the stresses is, a number of ways of outputting this information. Can you change the mesh size? Yes, you have mesh uh, size options and local, you can even get to local selections and decide. So you can do some amount of customization here, but 
again, it's a very limited, <coughs> not like a hyper mesh type of customization, but you can get really decent uh, results that way, right? Of course, these profiles could be looked at as uh, stress profiles, like so, or uh, the number of ways these results are displayed, right? That's, uh, see, I would again there, whether you want contour shading or no shading or, you know, smooth shading. So this, it all depends on how, what you're trying to show. It certainly puts out a report in terms of uh, general report, it gives you all the uh, details. It gives you all these aspects like uh, strain, stress, limiting strain, limiting stress, failure analysis, one misses. So it's very extensive. Uh, this is what a typical report would, would look like. And even for the simple case study that I ran, it gives you about a 15, 20 page report actually. Um, so if you want to convey that you've done even little amount of work, generate a report, is what I would say. So it doesn't, may not mean much, but you something in there. So uh, here again, what I'm thinking is as follows. You have the bicycle that you have worked with in your, uh, uh, or you're working with in your uh, test to party, that is the mountain bike and the regular bike and so on. So I would say pick the most critical load bearing uh, part of that bike being the frame, the triangular frame and the Truss, the truss part of the bike, right? And you don't have to do the entire bike, but pick that as your key part and run stress analysis on those, uh, on that uh, uh, component of the bike, right? And look at different case studies, like change the cross section. So there I like each person to think about what parameters would you change from a geometry standpoint or in terms of optimizing the stresses. So like look at the basic shape first, and try to update that shape to start minimizing the stresses based on geometry changes of that shape. That way, it's, it, each assignment will be personalized to a person, and that way you have exactly a very, uh, each person has a very different you know, answer based on how, how they see it actually. So I like the uh, uh, FEA part to extend from part A to part B like that. That's, that's what I was thinking, just using the bike. You just one type of bikes, like mountain bike or road bike? Or yeah, any one is fine, but to go through at least a couple of case studies within that to show that when I use this cross-section of this geometry is what happened. I went from a tube to a oblong ellipse, or I made it more like a dumbbell shape, for example. Did that improve uh, the design? Did it not improve the design, right? So you should be able to show based on the report. Just don't blindly print the report, but look at each and do a critical analysis of what happened with that shape change to the results that you have generated. So, so that is, I'll write this in the assignment description. That's kind of what I'm thinking with the, that will be a follow up from part A. It won't be mind uh, completely separate. Can we use the letters? Huh? Can we use the letters? Yeah, if you have an advanced software, please use that. I have no problem. Any software is fine. Any software is fine. Just uh, but state what you have used. and uh, uh, But the thing is, you have to work on it. Not somebody's software, somebody else working and emailing you the solution is not a solution. It's okay. Uh, okay, so I'll leave you a little bit of time to practice. I gave a very... Uh, Overview of how the but here's all the outputs. You want me to see stresses, first principle stress, right? All these you can plot safety factors and everything like that. So where the minimum stress occurred, where the maximum stress occurred. It also gets into where the stress stress patterns are, where the displacements are, the strain patterns are. So the result uh, file is pretty extensive. Actually, so. <coughs> Let's go back to, so going to Jared's question, we have to find this. I figured it out. You have it? Okay. Yeah. Although, um, I'm a little, can you go over again how to change the material? Sure. Let's like try. For assigning the material. Oh, you're already closed. No, it's okay. I accidentally closed it. So. <coughs> I 
should have the assignment be to manufacture that. Uh, yeah, that'll be for the final exam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the CAD and then the molds for it. Well, you're including the flexible cable. Yeah. And the <laughs> <laughs> Wing is ready to kill me. <laughs> So it doesn't like my more flow licenses, but it is okay with the others. So, um, so I'll pull back the part 45 which I tried. Okay, the other now thing to, uh, I just showed you the split option to, to make the two, right? That would be like your very basic option there. If you go to uh, environment there again, and when you go to begin, now you'll start seeing there is whole kinds of other uh, tools in there. Like, of course, this was going to the FEA tool, so so to Jared's question, that's what you would click to get to the FEA part of it. But if you, if I go to this second tool, which is my mold uh, design tool, it pulls this uh, this part up, which creates some sort of a reconfiguration for ready for designing the mold actually. So in this again, like I said, there is, uh, I'm treating that as my plastic part. Okay. Sorry, I was already, I had opened it. So this is one thing I want to point out. When you open this part up in mold design, uh, it's going to give you an auto-generated uh, box like this. Okay. like green, it converts your model from the gray to a green uh, color and then it does this red line uh, uh, box around it, virtual box and it puts an arrow actually, okay? So what it's trying to do is it's going to tell you if I make a mold, I will be pulling the mold in that direction and that's not exactly what you want, right? Because it's not the most logical way to... So it's just going by some coordinates that you initially used to build your model, so you don't have to accept that. What you can do then is, uh, you can select an edge. So now, what it does now, it changes my opening direction to exactly how I want it. So the way to get to that is select uh, an edge of the direction that you want, so that it will that becomes your molding direction from then on, right? Um, then what happens? Um, what happens? Yeah. <clears throat> then you can define all your. Uh, I did my orientation definition. Now I can show uh, what my workpiece will look like, right? So now what it takes, it takes the size of your model, and then it kind of puts a workbox around it, approximately telling that your mold will be this length, this width, this height. It's based off what your model dimensions are. Again, you don't have to accept it for what it's uh, worth. You can always change these values to what you actually want that tool to be looking like. It's just going to give you an optimized uh, dimension based on what it's thinking. It's, it's fully flexible, though. that's the point I'm trying to make. So then it actually put a workpiece you know, around that thing, right? Now here's the other thing here that happens is this uh, runoff surfaces. So what now it's doing is, it's going to take your uh, model and it wants you to generate the runoff surfaces. This is your part, but as you know, a mold actually has more than just the part. It has extra flanges that stick out of the part. Because the part is one thing, but to make the actual uh, core and cavity, you want additional uh, real estate in the mold, right? To basically uh, position that. So that's where you have to create runoff surfaces. So what, essentially you pick each of these guys, like so, which means, this, and I think I'll show it and that may make more sense. So I'm picking all the surfaces like that. Right. And, uh, 
So you notice it took all my and showed arrows going out essentially, right? So what it did, if you look, it basically created right runoff surfaces from from my part going outwards, right? It created a virtual space to, to do that part of it. So if all goes well, you can uh, see that it will uh, optimize it. In some cases, you may get gaps and so on, so that uh, uh, web video I want you to watch has that example. It's a hair dryer uh, module, right? And it has handle and the uh, blowing portion. And there, when you try to do it, you have a lot of gaps that come about. So the runoff surfaces are not as clean as this. In that case, you can go in and patch. You can literally, it's like quilting. When you quilt something, you patch here, you patch there, right? So it's the same analogy, you're quilting to create those runoff surfaces there. So that's that's what it does. Uh, then based on that, what you're doing is you can now say, okay, show me how my tool will look like. Right now it's going to give you the two tool halves. The top is the green, the bottom is the blue. And you can see the separation of the tool halves to see how do they actually separate out, right? So if you look at that, you can see that this is how your part would be made. It has a, a cavity, right? And it has a, a core, which is the top portion. Remember in the previous case, we didn't have that, right? It just split it down the middle. Half remained here, half remained there. But here, the runoff surface becomes your parting line. So that's where the tool is parted, right? It basically it gives you the male portion, the female portion, all that gets captured in the draw of the part. So this is where you can actually, in the hair dryer example, the top surface comes, it has like a bulge to mold into the uh, cavity, which is like a receiver, right? That's how the material gets molded in that, that particular shape right there. So uh, this way you can check for your uh, uh, separation and, and all that. And of course, in this, what's not added is the locator pins and the... So this goes one step further when we do the uh, uh, mold design, meaning putting the mold base, the ejectors, and all that. This gets carried over to the next step to do that. But this is basically the way you would take any complex part. And uh, there will be more time spent in creating the runoff surfaces. But then once you have the parting line established, this is what you send to the tool maker to machine the top and the bottom. So then, of course, what's not captured is the T-slot cavities to hold the tool down. There are other things that go, standard attachments to a tool to hang the tool on the press and so on. That's not completely uh, captured here. Does it, does it let you do unscrewing molds? Say that again? Does it let you do unscrewing molds? Unscrewing? Yeah. Tell me, I did. Where, like, Think about your closures. If you can't strip the threads off, you've got you've got a, a core that forms the threads, and it's uh, geared so that it rotates so that as you eject, as you open the mold, oh, yeah, it unscrews yeah. at the proper speed to uh, yeah. to let the part come out. So that I think Steven has done better in MasterCam software. Okay. Uh, this so again. This is pretty basic. Uh, it's I would say medium. It's not like the very basic. Yeah. You can do sliders. You can do lifters. You can do uh, mold bases. You can do side action. Side action. You can do ejectors. So it has those up to that. But anything more complex than that, uh, it would have to go through master cam software. Uh, but here again, remember the goal of what I'm trying to show you here is to take parts to prototype. And this really can get you there. I mean, in terms of uh, everything that you prototype, you are within that space, space to do it. Um, so on this, uh, let's maybe just rather than go into more mold flow, uh, let's take a few minutes and watch this one video, which is to me it's interesting to do this one. And you can see it at your leisure, but um, let me force you to watch it. With me, so that it's So this, he has gone through mold flow, which I will skip because I have not yet shown you how to do that. 
But generally, when you make your basic model, you first see if the part can fill or not, doing the mold flow analysis before you get to the mold design part. Getting so keep an eye on that opening direction there. Changed it to this way. When you have features like this, you can close and dumb them off. Like I was telling you, you don't have a keeper. There are few of them. That's the material selection, Jared. doing a gate uh, gate location suggestion this is the mold flow part of it which I have not yet shown you but he's putting a gate here and then he's trying to see does it fill or not so I'm going to advance that part of it I'm going to try to What he did is he put the gate here. So it gives you the coordinates of the gate. Now you actually see does it fill or not. And then he's actually looking at he starts the polymer here and it sees the fill across it. And I'll show you that part of it in the next class. Now he's doing what we did, putting the workpiece around it. And now he's changing the dimensions of the model, uh, mold if he wants to do that. He's dumbing that, he's closing all that. This is where the runoff you may want to spend some time. It's not obvious, like some places he's not able to run off fully, so he just gets these gaps, you see. Yeah, I can see several sleepless nights in this part of it. <laughs> Once it even more, you will see he has gotten further up. So it's like quilting, like that's the best analogy. A lot of patches you're adding. By the way, you can also extrude surfaces if they are not existing. So that's the other thing. So most of the time went in creating this, the rest of it went fast. Showing his parting lines. So you see the cavity is there, and then the core you can see has that male bulb part of it, right? So now this becomes. So to this, he will add the injection lines, the gate locations, and build the mold from there on. This part is just the core of the cavity. Post these videos to the uh, canvas and you can uh, 
also there's one on the cell phone. I like you to see that one as well. So today, I think uh, we've done some spotty things. What we have done was the uh, uh, showed you a brief of the FEA. I showed you how to create a split mold. I showed you how to create a standard mold with this approach. And we saw this video. I'd like you to also visualize the uh, uh, cell phone video. And then next class, I will talk about the mold flow advisor and then how to take the model in the mold flow and what to do there. Uh, so then you should have enough uh, background to take uh, your existing, uh, like I already told you, part B of the test as far as FEA goes. And I will work on a specific thing for your mold flow part of that. Because the frame assumes it could be metal. If it's made out of plastic, you could, of course. But I may give a separate part just for the mold flow portion. portion of that. Any questions? Or everybody's good? Well, I'm good. So that's fine. Thank you.